um, gentlemen, uh, please uh, start the conversation and um, probably give us an overview of the capacity that we now have for irrigation in Tasmania, again, to this city boy. Um, well, thank you. I might start if that's mm. convenient. But before I really get into the issue of irrigation, Tasmanian Irrigation is quite an unusual company in that it's more than just about pipes and pumps in the ground, and that's probably where we started um, a few years ago. But some of you who, who know me might find it unusual that I would uh, quote from the Bible. But I actually think the Bible's a good place to start today in this discussion. And those of you who know your theology, and thankfully we've got someone who we work with who does, who looks after our spiritual health, more, will be the battle. Um, Exodus 21 to 17, God spoke these words, and these are the Ten Commandments. And the first few commandments go through all the good stuff. Uh, murdering, killing, um, adultery, all the things stealing you shouldn't be doing. But at the Tenth Commandment, God sort of verges into economics and quite strangely says, Thou shalt not covet your wife, your house, your neighbour's wife, your donkey, ox or anything else. And to me, that's where we start in irrigation. It's not about wanting uh, and feeling privileged that you've got something someone else hasn't got. Or it's like not looking over your neighbour's fence and seeing that he's lucky enough to have an irrigation scheme. Luck's got nothing to do with it. You don't go and take what your neighbour's got and you don't have a right to get it. You have to go out and earn it. And sitting next to me, I've got Richard Gardner. And Richard's got a, um, a dairy farm that's now up and running. I hear 20 cows through at the moment or something. That's not luck. He's gone out and done that himself. So there's no point Richard saying, oh, it's not fair, these other guys have got water. Um, why haven't I? He's actually gone out and done it himself. And that's where I think this commandment becomes interesting. It's not about being jealous of other people's uh, wealth. It's a matter of going out and earning your own taking the risk and that's what these guys have done but also we're in the area of spending money and we spend uh, a mixture of uh, public and private money and the, the noted 20th century economists uh, Milton and Rose Friedman said basically there's four ways you can spend money the first is spend money on yourself the second is spend your money on other people the third is to spend other people's money on yourself and the fourth and this is the kicker spend other people's money on other people. And that's what governments do. And if you're not careful, you wind up with a Hobart hospital, that sort of thing. So we take our responsibility on how we spend other people's money on other people really seriously. And I'd like to think we do that perhaps a little bit better than some other groups. Before I finish uh, this little rant and hand over to some people who know what they're talking about, the other thing I want to talk about is this concept of wealth and that's what we're doing in Tasmania by bringing irrigation to areas that haven't grown, um, haven't grown crops before. The thing about wealth or prosperity is that it's not finite. It's not like a pizza. If you have the pizza, I have to eat the box. That's not right. The pizza can actually be bigger. It's not finite. So when we're trying to create wealth in this state, it doesn't necessarily just have to go to a few people. The ability is there for that wealth pie or that wealth pizza effectively to be limitless based on your willingness to have a crack at what you're doing. And again, I hope that's where we can come into the party of this by demonstrating, by buying water, by converting land, there is the opportunity. So just to finish that point, you know, wealth is based on productivity and in my view, productivity um, is expandable. So, so that that's where we are today as a company. We think that we're doing our bit towards developing uh, agriculture in the state. We want to see wealth created. We want to see regional communities supported. And irrigation is just a method towards doing that. But importantly, it's these guys who are actually doing it. Uh, philosophy, theology and um, economics all in the space of two minutes. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Theology things will worry, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to a former Irish Catholic. Um, <laughs> please, Chris, your comment. You've got, sorry, Chris, the other Chris. Um, yeah, and I, I unfortunately have not come quite as well prepared with Chris uh, for you. I sort of, um, uh, I, I suppose all I can say is that the development has gone in Tasmania from a, an irrigation point of view has been 
fantastic and it's probably um, unequal just about anywhere in the world at the moment in relation to you know the opportunities it's created for this state so um, I think the partnership that that's um, been created between federal state government and farmers in, in you know developing irrigation has um, really opened up a you know a huge amount of opportunity for us over the next um, well, it, you know, up to 100 years because this is the lifespan of the schemes. It is interesting, again, uh, from looking from the outside coming in, and my area is actually drugs, so therefore poppies are of great interest to me in Tasmania. And I remember when they were talking about the possibility of uh, doing some trials interstate, that people basically turned around and said, well, it may or may not work, but we've got one good guarantee here. Now we've got this irrigation system set up around the state. We've got guaranteed water. Uh, I think that's a very, I think that, do you think that's a, a key point to Tasmania moving forward with niche crops like that? Will we talk about niche again? Oh, um, absolutely. I think if you, if you, um, following on um, from the the, re, uh, the panel discussion before, you can't create markets for products unless you can um, consistently produce them. You know, produce quality and quantity, and and th that underpins everything you do. So, the, I think that. I see this de-irrigation development as just building the bottom layer, the foundation for our industry really and, and the key to that foundation is that it is high security water so that, you know, the reason we've gone and made the investment in the dairy is purely because we know that we've got that water there 95% of the time. It's all about water surety, it's not about, we've all had water available for irrigation, well a lot of us have, um, you know, we've seen greenfield developments but I would say the majority of the water is actually going into areas where there's already been irrigation but the big difference is the surety of it. So you layer that secure foundation of productivity onto um, the marketing and then you really create the value. And I think, just to add another point to that, I think that one of the things that if you, if you look at how successful New Zealand's been in its marketing, um, a lot of New Zealand's agriculture is underpinned by very secure production systems. And it's the one thing that's probably, I think, is the most different between us and them is their ability to, to produce consistently um, because they don't have the same climatic um, you know, risks that we do. If I could just go on from those comments to Richard and Chris, which I echo totally. Um, my sort of passage, I suppose, has been being involved in the, the, the development of irrigation since the early 80s. Um, the question, we'd have someone come and visit us and say, look, we're interested in, in growing this or growing that. And the first thing you'd say, right, well, it's probably, it's likely you need irrigation support. And they'd say, well, right, great, can you organise that? Now, the process of organising a secure water supply for someone to do anything significant is often a three to five year process. And they go, well, gee, I'm not gonna hang around for that. Um, that's, that's, that's been able to be fostered by people who've had the early hanging fruit, the low hanging fruit, sorry, um, where they've had opportunities to do that. But over the last 15 years in particular, where there have been lots of opportunities turned up, but there's been the process of getting them to anything has often been secure land with water. Um, the whole process of what's occurred with the Tasmanian irrigation development, the reason it's, it's so fantastic is that, that someone's taken the risk, being the government initially, and supported by the farmers are going, right, oh, well, let's make this happen. And it's that old adage of you, know, you build it and they will come, and I'm, I'm an absolute believer in that. It's we have incredible. We hear it all the time, but we have incredible entrepreneurs within our farming areas. But at the end of the day, for them to actually develop scale and develop the opportunity to come from the water is impossible by themselves. And that's where there was a market failure, and government intervention in what they've done has been outstanding. And now what we see is there aren't limitations for those things to occur now. The, uh, we've got that situation where innovation and entrepreneurship can develop from the fact that the opportunities are there. So um, I think that's not well understood in the process of why you do irrigation development. It's not one, I'd argue now that, um, that any irrigation development of any size outside of government intervention is bordering on impossible anywhere in Australia. Um, and the time frames are very long. So um, that's why I think we are sitting on something very special at the moment. It's interesting, I'll go back to uh, Holger's comment about vision. I mean, my wife has a lovely philosophical statement on her wall that has vision is not seeing things as they are, but what they can be. 
So we are now at the very beginning of a, a really key period in Tasmanian agriculture with the establishment of all these irrigation systems. What do you see as being some amazing um, eventualities in five years' time? Because you're saying, and we all know it, it's a three to five year thing. Is there any new, completely new opportunities that we might have? Uh, obviously only ones that you don't want to release to the rest of the community. Uh, look, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's a classic because I do know of some that I can't speak about. But, <laughs> but there, look, there are there are so many opportunities. I, I think one of the key things that we need to understand is that uh, sitting at latitude forty two, uh, plus or minus, we are we are in cool climate heaven. We are in a place that you can grow a lot of the things in the world that that people want. It's it's not it's not a coincidence that 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 people want Tasmania produce, it's the type of things that grow at latitude 42 that don't grow in the tropics, that don't grow elsewhere. And and to have a climate also that's that's in most cases reasonably dry, reasonably predictable with water available, there are difficulties like any agriculture, but there are so many things that can occur. You know, it might be we might see a thousand hectares of pears sitting in the middle and in Midlands in five years' time because there might be a pear variety that fits that, and that might be the only place it can be grown in the world, and that might go into baby food production for bellamies or something. Yep. There are, but without the basis, it's not there. There's all sorts of opportunities. You know, there might be biodiesel, there's, there's incredible things that can occur, but it's, it's the, the farming community will be the drivers. They'll drive the innovation, but, but the opportunities now are there for them to work on it. Look, I, I agree with, with Tomo that the opportunity is limitless. They're only limited by our imagination. Where I get a bit worried, though, is where we start, uh, where we start this process. I have no doubt that Tasmanian farmers are highly innovative and can be the most innovative farmers in the country. But that in itself is not going to be enough. And that's why I say, as an irrigation business, we're a bit unusual, is we're looking outside the farm and outside the state. And I often wonder um, who's more important in the value chain when we're trying to establish new markets. Is it the research scientist figuring out how a, a pivot works better? Or is it the bloke who's got the rickshaw in Hong Kong who has to deliver a fresh piece of Tasmanian salmon or carrots to a, to a cafe? And he gets caught at traffic lights and the thing goes off. So it turns up in the hotel and no one eats it. I, I think that person is just as important to know as the farmer, as the researcher. And that's where I don't think we've put enough time in. I'm sure technically we can grow a whole lot of things, but unless we make sure that product is delivered to the consumer in the absolute prime condition, it's not gonna work. And as one of the previous speakers said, nobody has to buy anything from Tasmania. There's plenty of other places. So why do they have to buy from us? Because we understand what it takes to get their product to their plate. And hopefully if they're eating a piece of Tasmanian salmon or a Tasmanian carrot, their mate sitting next to them will too because the first guys had a good experience. And I just think we put a lot of effort into the back end and not enough into understanding what that consumer wants because he's the customer. I don't know if anyone from Houston's is here, but if you go and ask Colin Houston, who's, who's your customer? He doesn't say Coles. He says the housewife in Sunshine in Melbourne. We don't do enough of that in this state, I believe. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Any burning questions or comments for our panel? To um, Margaret and Amy. Sorry, you've got a glow, you've got a glow about your head as well from these lights. Yeah. Um, I think you both said that uh, that's great. Irrigation's the beginning, and we need to make this pizza as big as possible as soon as possible. So what are the next steps that we can make to get that pizza bigger, faster? Because if it's left to farmers, we kind of take our time doing things. Is there anything we can do to make a difference to those people in Avoca who might be losing their childcare or their school, primary school is going to close down and their students are going to have to travel two hours for a primary school? How do we make that happen faster? Are there things we can do? Can I pass one comment? It needs to be a quality pizza. Uh, I'm not sure. 
I could come up with a great answer for you, Amy, because I think that is the burning question, that we've put the foundation in place and now we're relying on the farming community to make that investment. Tasmania is a really challenging environment to connect investment, I think, with um, farmers and, the, and the, the landowners because of the scale of what we do. Um, I think, you know, in the theme of what we're talking about here at the moment, I think that, you know, underpin a lot of the production systems with really good research and make sure that we can have good access to information. So I've just done a dairy conversion and, um, you know, there were varying levels of um, availability of information on how to get from um, starting point to finishing point and I've had to do a lot of research work that I probably thought might have been a bit more easily accessible than it was. So um, I think there's a whole... Um, area in there where we can support development for, for people wanting to get into, into industries and that's from a point of view of just looking at what the markets are and also the logistics around developing um, the new enterprises. So for me I think that's probably the area and I think that's obviously that ties in well with what we're talking about here. That's a, a, you know, a role for TIA as well. Margaret? Um, question that I was going to ask the panel which is a research based one. Uh, because there's a lot of research that can be done, but are there uh, um, questions in research that TIA might want to pursue? Uh, and I'll um, speak briefly about the uh, law of the commons, about who actually gets involved in managing water for the, for, for the best output, but also um, how you engage communities uh, in making decisions which might mean we do irrigation better than the rest of Australia. Uh, yeah, look, that's a really good one. Um, I've got a, a bit of a pet pet view on this process, and one of the things um, I think one of the biggest holes or knowledge gaps we have at the moment is what we are currently doing. Uh, we've we've had a like a massive explosion in in irrigation development over the last ten years in Tasmania, and, and a um, a lot of a lot of practices underway. There are people doing things incredibly well and there are people doing things incredibly badly, but we don't really know what that is. And I think my view at the moment is until we actually get some baseline research on what's out there and what's working, um, it's, very, it's very hard to determine how in isolation you, you, what's the best fix. Because I think at the moment the best fix in a lot of cases is probably already happening out there with people, but we don't know that. So. I'm a, I'm a very strong advocate of we need to do some really strong baseline uh, research and benchmarking within the irrigation sector. We've done incredibly smart things like that in, in uh, commodity sectors within the beef industry and people like that. And it's been fantastic what it's achieved, but we haven't done it with water. Um, and until we've got that baseline information across the board, and there's an opportunity for everyone involved in that, the farm sector, the the suppliers and consultants, TAS Irrigation, to actually work together and, and collect all this information and then start to make those decisions. Um, I, I just on a technical point, um, I think that the one thing that we really need to focus on um, in Tasmania is soil constraints. Um, you know, we have got, some parts of the state have got phenomenal soils, but the majority of the state, the one limitation we've got that, that um, counters against all of the advantage we've got is we've got some of the poorest um, soils to grow agricultural crops on in, in the world, basically. So, you know, we're putting all this water on there. Unless we can really, uh, I think, get to a point where we can either modify or manage those soils better than we're doing now, we're always going to be constrained in the way we can produce um, particularly crops. Uh, the limitations around drainage, you know, we get wet seasons and it doesn't matter how much irrigation you've got, you've got problems. And so you, there's real risk around that area. And you, if I was going to put any effort into... If I was going to put my primary effort into agricultural research, it'll be soil constraints in this state, I would have thought, to make the most advantage out of the work that we've um, put into irrigation. Um, thanks. I guess my comment on research is, is, is interesting in that I was in Victoria last week and came across a, a drover with four dog boxes on the back and I love talking to people about dogs. So we're chatting about his dogs and he came up with this phrase that it costs just as much to feed a good dog as it does a bad dog, so you might as well have a good dog. And I'm not inferring for a moment that TR's a dog, but, <laughs> but what I do mean is I think 
people like me have been very willing to uh, criticise TR in the past. If I, for lack of perhaps practical research, if I look at it more deeply, that's probably just as much my fault and my colleagues' fault for not engaging enough with the research bodies in this state. It's very easy to sit on the outside and say, why doesn't TR do this? It's a lot harder to actually get in and try and engage. And I th would like to think over the next few months, and I think we've already started this process, that our level of engagement will be a lot better. Because I do think that research, broad research, underpins what we're doing. And as I said, it's very easy to sit on the side and criticise, harder to get involved. We've made a conscious decision to engage, and I hope that will be, um, be acknowledged in the future. We're just about out of time. Um, I just I, I tried to do a little bit of background research the other day, and uh, I just thought I'd finish up by letting you know we're talking about quality of food and niche food. And uh, one of my favourite books is by uh, Michael Pollan. It's called uh, The Defence of Food and Eating, uh, An Eater's Manifesto or something like that. And he was asked, when they asked a food scientist what is good food, it says a good mixture of quality, naturally occurring protein, carbohydrate, lipid and nucleic acids, which may, the body may use to generate energy and maintain normal function. Michael Pollan's answer was, if it rots, it's probably food. If it doesn't, it's probably not. So uh, I'd like you to thank Chris, Chris and Richard. And um, we're now moving to morning tea. Ooh, that's very loud. I've got a very loud voice. There we go. We're now moving to morning tea. So you feel free to grab your morning tea and take it into the main room, uh, where, room 29, where the tables are, where there will be eight discussion tables. I think it's eight discussion tables. There'll be two rounds of 45 minutes, so everybody can attend uh, two of them. And then after that, please feel free to grab lunch. And then we have lunch from around about um, just about two o'clock after that. So uh, please, we need a scribe, by the way, at each of the tables, so I think the, the le table leaders can take some notes and they can provide those to um, uh, Holger or whoever it is that's supposed to be provided. So thank you very much for your involvement this morning. I think that was really, really good. Thank you.